Okay, thank you everybody. I know there's gonna be some in and outs as people are still grabbing their coffee and using the restroom. Um, so it sounds like uh, there was a nice segue on the chronic pain talk before, before mine, and uh, I apologize if there's some redundancy. Looks like there's a little bit more flexibility in the schedule, so I'm more than happy to go off script if people have questions that relate to something other than the neuropsychological treatment of chronic pain. We can talk about the secondary cognitive effects, the, how it impacts a child's learning. I see we had a, a school advocate here as well. So um, figure out how to work this. Okay, so um, what, what I plan to talk about is uh, just the, the general psychological experience of chronic pain. Um, I think a lot of it applies also to acute pain, but I think when we're talking about pain associated with chronic medical conditions, it, it is more important to talk about the long-term implications and management. Um, so, you know, when we think about the nature of the pain experience, um, there are multiple factors, and obviously there's a very important component that's physical. Um, we've had a lot of, uh, it, it sounds like there was some discussion about what the neurological basis of the pain experience is. Um, but if you really think about the pain experience, it's only about 25% physical. It's what happens when chronic pain comes into the picture um, that is the secondary effects. And uh, it's actually a bi-directional influence because sometimes um, we see chronic pain evolving more uh, prominently in people who may have some predisposition towards emotional uh, dysregulation and uh, like depression and anxiety. So there's this bi-directional uh, interaction between the physical and uh, the psychological aspects of it. So from a physical uh, point of view, uh, you know, the, the actual pain experience is triggered by a number of different things. Um, there's, there's no susceptive pain. And, and again, I apologize if this is redundant if it was covered earlier. Um, but, uh, you know, no susceptive pain is actually it's supposed to be an adaptive experience. It is something that alerts you to a threat to the person. Um, so it's typically triggered by um, one of uh, several different uh, mechanisms. There's the mechanical aspect or mechanical nociceptive receptors that respond to a physical injury. Um, so this is trauma. Um, but there's also thermal and chemical, and then what we call polymodal uh, receptors for pain. So pain, uh, the, the initial acute experience of pain can come from a lot of different physical sources. Um, chronic pain is often neuropathic rather than nociceptive. Um, neuropathic pain is more chronic um, and occurs in the nerves themselves. It can occur in response to a chronic inflammation. It can occur in response to chronic uh, pressure or other uh, forces. Um, we see chronic neuropathic pain in a number of conditions. It can be from uh, metabolic disturbance, so uh, in type, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, you can get peripheral neuropathy associated with the diabetes. Um, I work in a pediatric clinic where we see a large number of patients with neurofibromatosis, uh, which is a genetic condition uh, that affects uh, the nerves and, and the skin. And so the, the nerves actually can grow tumors that cause chronic pain. So there's a lot of different pathways uh, physically to, to pain. Now, when you think about the initial treatment of pain, we think about the medical model, right? And that is um, you identify uh, the source of the pain, and the treatment focuses on either eliminating the source of pain or reducing the inflammation associated with that source. But it's usually medication, surgery, and time. Um, but that doesn't really begin to address the issues that occur when you can't fix the underlying problem, which is what most of chronic pain people experience. That is, um, again, if there's a genetic condition like neurofibromatosis or a lot of serum, serum go my, serum, a lot of Chiari patients. <laughs> Um, and, you know, so there, there are instances where you can't actually eliminate the cause of the pain, and that leads to the development of uh, chronic pain. 
So what happened uh, is in around the 1960s, and certainly the evolution of this has uh, continued through the 90s and into the early 2000s, is um, they developed what's called a, a biopsychosocial model of pain. And what that does is recognizes that beyond their ability to actually address or fix the underlying cause of pain, there are other mediators of pain um, that are inherent in the social environment that may reinforce pain behaviors, um, but also that are inherent in the individual. So pain can trigger um, you know, uh, uh, reactions related to, for example, learned helplessness, uh, depression and anxiety. <clears throat> um, and, and the biopsychosocial models incorporated an understanding of these non-medical factors, not only to understanding the subjective pain experience, but also to treating the, the pain. And one of the things that with the biopsychosocial model is that, like other chronic illnesses, chronic pain may not be able to be cured. So the focus is, like with type 1 or type 2 diabetes, where you, you may not be able to cure the diabetes, the focus is on managing it rather than curing it. Um, and, and so biopsychosocial models for pain began to introduce um, additional or alternative therapies. Um, so this is sort of, uh, you know, you can Google image uh, biopsychosocial models and you'll get thousands of different versions of these flow charts and, and uh, Venn diagrams. But the idea is <clears throat> that in most cases, pain is triggered by something. So in nociceptive injury, um, you have pain triggered by either physical or uh, uh, mechanical or chemical or thermal damage um, to tissue. Um, but you can get neuropathic pain from trauma as well, or uh, infection, illness, cancer, uh, that produces nerve damage. Um, so it's a very complex process that starts with some physical experience or injury. This leads to both physical and psychological reactions. So the psychological reactions that you may get, a, a lot of people complain that uh, it, it's, uh, it alters their sleep pattern. Um, you, you have people that uh, simply are overwhelmed by the intensity or chronicity of their pain and um, uh, fail to develop good coping skills. It can lead to fear of doing an activity or anxiety associated with the pain. Uh, and, and of course, there's a phenomenon called learned helplessness, and that is that in the face of um, not being able to do anything about something that um, you simply withdraw and become depressed. So um, the learned helplessness model is one where it was actually developed with animals where what they did was um, they, they um, introduced a noxious stimulus that caused pain to the animals. And they had two groups. And one of the groups of the animals was uh, given an opportunity to escape from the pain by moving to a different area of the cage. And the others, when they moved to the different area of the cage, um, experienced the same pain. And what they found was after a very short period of time, the animals that couldn't uh, escape the pain just sort of stopped trying to escape the pain. They just sort of withdrew and sat down and took it. Um, and so this is a model of depression where people with chronic pain that can't do anything about it sort of give up after a while. Um, and, and so it's important to recognize the dynamic uh, interface between the physical and the psychological when we're talking about um, uh, chronic pain. Um, the other aspects where the social in the biopsychosocial comes in is uh, like I'm sure everybody in this room has experienced either personally or through a family member or through their patients is that it doesn't affect just one person. It affects the entire family. Most of these conditions are family conditions. So if you have a child who's experiencing chronic pain, um, that's really difficult on the parents. And if you have a child who has chronic medical conditions as a parent, you've got to take them to a lot of uh, appointments. Um, as the person becomes uh, an adult, they may have limited uh, um, opportunities for work. Uh, they may have uh, limited capacity to do certain types of work. So you have economic variables that come into play. So it's this dynamic interaction that, that starts either with a medical condition that causes chronic pain or an injury that, is, um, uh, that doesn't resolve as, as expected. And I think one of the things that we don't realize is that um, there's 
uh, estimates that about 100 million people in the U.S. have experienced chronic pain, defined as six months or more of persistent pain. And the overall economic costs are up to 600 billion, with a B, dollars when you consider um, hospitalizations, emergency room visits, um, and uh, the lost economic uh, aspects of, of chronic pain. Um, <clears throat> so it is a, a, a really uh, complicated condition. So what are the stages of the evolution of pain? Acute pain um, is obviously the, the first, and, and as I said, it, acute pain is supposed to be adaptive. The pain trigger leads to behavior change. Um, you know, it's, if you put your hand on a hot stove and you have pain, you take your hand off that hot stove. It's supposed to teach you or tell you that that is not an adaptive behavior and that you should avoid it. Now, in treating uh, acute pain, uh, I talked about the medical model, and that's where the medical model takes a primary, uh, pr uh, uh, primary position where acute pain, you know, if it's a broken bone, you set the broken bone, you can treat it with medication to alleviate the pain. Um, but there's a, um, an intermittent stage, and this is where the critical stage where uh, transition from acute to chronic pain uh, uh, takes place. So how the initial acute injury or how the initial pain experience is handled and dealt with um, will, will be determined in that uh, critical period. So the pain either begins to remit because the treatment is effective or it doesn't. And what happens in the intermittent stage is where the psychological variables begin to uh, come into play. So uh, there's, there's worry and anxiety. Am I ever going to get better? Is this ever going to go away? Uh, is there anything I can do to alleviate the pain? Uh, you get changes in lifestyle. It may disrupt sleep. It may cause avoidance or uh, inability to go to school or work. <clears throat> And so this is the critical period. Intervention at the earlier stages is really important. And dealing with the psychological aspects of the transition as soon as the physician or the family member uh, that the, the uh, companion family members uh, recognize that the pain doesn't seem to be following a typical course uh, is critical. Uh, we see this, you know, sort of deviating off of pain just for a second, uh, we see this in concussion. So there's concussion hysteria right now. The typical course of recovery from an uncomplicated concussion is usually about 72 hours to a week. Um, and so when we see somebody in our clinic with headaches and concussion-related cognitive changes three months afterwards, we know it's not from that concussion anymore. So the psychological vari variables, the, the expectation as the etiology is, is uh, what, what you're dealing with. And so as soon as you see an injury or somebody with an, uh, an illness or condition that has the potential to turn into chronic pain, you should start begin uh, to introducing psychological coping strategies as soon as possible. Um, chronic pain, of course, is uh, defined as pain that lasts over six months. <clears throat> and um, uh, in an acute injury triggered chronic pain, this is way past the period of physiological healing. So the orthopedic or the muscular injury will typically have healed within that six month period. So the, the duration of the chronic pain in those cases um, is again, largely mediated by psychological factors. So you get what's called both uh, physical and mental deconditioning. The physical deconditioning comes in that you um, start avoiding activities like exercise because it causes pain, which then leads to deconditioning of, excuse me, uh, cardiovascular and muscular system. The psychological deconditioning is related to that learned helplessness phenomenon. You start to avoid activities and fear doing activities that you think may cause or trigger pain or exacerbate existing pain. Um, so then uh, the, the uh, social aspect comes in where now you're avoiding these activities and other people are uh, you know, stepping up to the plate to help you or pick up the slack, which then sort of reinforces that avoidance. Well, I don't have to do it because somebody else will do it for me or I'll, I'll get help from that. Um, so this is where that, that um, really difficult negative cycle starts to um, evolve. Um, the other thing that's important to keep in mind with biopsychosocial approaches is that pain is inherently subjective. 
So everybody in here could have the exact same physical injury, but we're all going to experience it in a different way. Um, some of us, you know, if, if uh, you know, we have the same physical injury, some of us may say it's a debilitating 10 on a scale of one to 10, but others may say, well, it's a two or three. I can still, I can work through it. Um, I've, I've become a soccer fan recently, and so I see these guys on the soccer field with, you know, these guys roll over their ankles, and it looks like they should be carried off on a stretcher, and they just hop right up and start playing again. Um, whereas me, I'd be on crutches, and so, you know, there's, there's an inherently subjective component to how we interpret the pain experience. Um, so you have to consider, as it says, uh, the physical injury and the source, as well as the secondary and the, the psychological components. Um, so all of that is uh, leading up to uh, so a review of what, uh, what you can do to address those psychological uh, components. Um, there are psychological therapies that are specifically designed to address the chronic pain experience. And again, it's not to say that, oh, it's all in your head. It's not. It's in, it's in your back. And, uh, you know, if it's a headache, it's in your head. But the point is that Chronic pain can be managed, just like diabetes can be managed and other chronic conditions can be managed. And so the initial stage of uh, you know, dealing with the psychological aspects is trying to get a comprehensive understanding of what is that person's psychological and social situation? What are the factors in those realms that are exacerbating the pain? And uh, it's in, again, it's important to keep in mind that there is no single approach to any of this. Just like you know, with somebody with a Chiari may respond you know, favorably to a surgical intervention, and some may not. Um, so it isn't like, well, there's one approach, and that's going to be fine for everybody. So there's basically four different um, approaches to psychological management of chronic pain that have been demonstrated to have effectiveness in various different conditions. And there's a lot of other psychological approaches, but these are, uh, I, I focused on the four that have been shown to be effective in managing chronic pain. So the first is operant behavior therapy uh, for, for chronic pain. Operant behavior therapy um, employs basic operant conditioning principles. So um, the, uh, we, we all know what operant conditioning principles are. There's positive and negative reinforcement and punishment. And it's important to distinguish negative reinforcement from punishment. Positive reinforcement, self-explanatory. You get rewarded for doing something. Negative reinforcement is you get rewarded for not doing something or for avoiding something. <clears throat> punishment, again, is pretty self-explanatory. If you do something and you get pain, that's a punishment. That, that tells you not to do that again. So the difference with negative reinforcement is you're avoiding a punishment by restricting your activity. Um, and then that becomes reinforcing because, hey, I didn't get out of bed today. I didn't have any pain, so I'm not going to get out of bed tomorrow. So what the operant behavior therapy approach does is it uses reinforcement and avoidance of punishment as the main principles. Now these are more effective with kids than some of the other psychological approaches that I'll talk about because um, the others focus more on managing the thinking process and dealing with anxiety through cognitive or other uh, behaviors. So what, what you would do in a, um, an operant conditioning or an operant behavior therapy program is you would start to identify what are some tolerable behaviors. And then what you try to do is develop a reinforcement schedule for that. If you, you know, get up and stretch, then you'll get extra time on your iPad, you know, if you're dealing with a child. Um, for an adult, you would try and uh, target high value behaviors that are important for the adult, maybe getting out and, uh, you know, going out to dinner with friends. Um, and so you reinforce adaptive behaviors like exercise and uh, stretching and, and things that are uh, designed to minimize the physical component. You also want to introduce time contingent medical management. So what that means basically is stay on your medication schedule. Try not to use medications PRN as, as much as possible. <clears throat> 
I know that's, that's one of the more difficult aspects of it, but it becomes important because one of the consequences or risks associated with uh, chronic pain is a, a prescription medication abuse or addiction. Um, so you want to try and uh, uh, maintain a, uh, a reasonable schedule of medications. Um, and that's not to say avoid medications. Medications are really a critical component for comfort and quality of life in managing chronic pain. But you want to try and walk that fine line between managing pain with medication and avoiding going down a, a road where it becomes dependent on, on the medication. And then um, you be basically introduce exposure therapy. This is uh, taken right from uh, you know, phobia treatments, where you, know, you, you basically say, OK, what are the things that you're afraid to do because you are going to uh, be worried about experiencing pain? And you develop a hierarchy of activities. It's, it's called su successive approximation to the final goal. And you start small. You know, if you want to run a marathon, you don't just sign up for the marathon and show up that day. You got to start small. You got to start with really um, major uh, uh, goals, but tiny steps towards those major goals. And you know, this is again parallel to the concussion management and return to play or return to work issue. Is you go as tolerated, and when you reach a point where you can't tolerate it, you back off, and then you you try again to hit that point. And if you've reached a plateau where you can never get beyond that point, then some of the other therapies that I'll talk about come into play. But you want to develop that higher, hierarchy of activities so that you can overcome the fear of uh, the activity. Um, the, uh, another uh, therapy is cognitive behavior therapy. So cognitive behavior therapy varies a little bit from the operant uh, conditioning uh, therapy is in that it focuses on the maladaptive thoughts associated with chronic pain. So um, y again, anybody who's experienced acute pain, I, I can't imagine that anybody in here hasn't had some pain, either acute or chronic. There's, there's a certain cognitive process that goes along with that. Um, you know, uh, if you get up and you have pain, you might uh, you know, think, oh, I can't do that, or I'm not going to be able to do that. And then again, you start to develop these maladaptive thoughts that generalize. So it starts to spread and goes beyond what the initial trigger of the pain is for you and, and starts to generalize. So cognitive behavior therapy focuses on what's rational avoidance? What is appropriate to avoid to minimize triggering pain? And what's irrational? And trying to um, develop a, a, a set of coping strategies to eliminate the irrational fears or the irrational avoidance and, uh, you know, again, maintaining the, the rational. Um, one of the other advantages of cognitive behavior therapy is that cognitive behavior therapy is recognized as one of the gold standard therapies for dealing with both anxiety and depression, which are secondary effects of chronic pain as well. So the last two um, psychological treatments for chronic pain are geared more towards acceptance. Um, so psychological therapies that use mindfulness or a mindfulness approach um, involves trying to accept the pain but manage it through relaxation. Uh, again, anybody who's had pain knows that you know, if you are experiencing pain, you start to tense up, which actually makes the pain worse, the physical experience of the pain. And then that contributes to the anxiety, which again, starts that negative cycle. So this is uh, an approach that um, helps a person to accept, OK, there are going to be limitations, but I'm going to try and manage some of my anxieties through meditation, relaxation, yoga. Um, it's a more uh, acceptance-based, and you learn to separate your thoughts from your emotions and your physical experiences. Um, to say, this is the physical experience of the pain, and I'm not going to let it bother me. I'm going to relax, and, and I'm going to separate the thoughts from the actual physical experience of the pain. The, um, the other is acceptance and commitment therapy. It is, uh, this, this is based a little bit more on, OK, we know that this isn't going to get better, or it may fluctuate. What are some realistic goals? And it's really goal setting in the context of understanding what our limitations are going to be. 
And the goal here is not only to, to try and manage the pain, but to improve the quality of life and help to mitigate some of the social factors, the family factors, the, the economic factors. So, you know, if you have a back pain and your job involved standing for several hours, well, maybe there are other jobs or accommodations in that job that you can get to minimize some of that. So it's a realistic appraisal of what your, your capabilities and your limitations are and trying to work within those. <clears throat> So just to summarize, um, you know, the, the whole idea is that there's this complex dynamic interaction between <clears throat> the physical experience of pain and what happens to our lives when we have chronic pain. Um, and psychological interventions really play an important role in helping to manage those aspects of chronic pain. <clears throat> and <clears throat> again, the goal is you want to make, uh, uh, try and maintain the best quality of life possible despite having to, uh, to live with chronic pain. Um, so I think that was, that was all I had. As I said, I'm uh, more than happy to go off script. I know that uh, there was some talk about uh, school implications and uh, you know, we can talk about how chronic pain in kids or pain in kids affects their learning if there's questions about that or uh, you know, some of the more uh, cognitive-based aspects of the uh, uh, chronic pain experience. So. Uh, what experience have you had with the behavioral aspect of uh, mass cell activation disorder and cognitive behavior? So I'm not sure that there's been any really um, direct work in that or, or any studies in that. Um, you know, I, I think, again, in terms of Cognitive behavior therapy, it's, it's really important to uh, consider the age of the patient. So in an adult, it's going to be much more um, effective than in a, in a child who, who may have limited ability to develop insight and to understand how their thoughts work. Um, you know, I think people that study and do a lot of cognitive behavior therapy will tell you that it could be applied to just about anything. So I'm, I'm not so sure when you're talking about chronic pain because it's not the same as just, you know, isolated depression um, where, you know, the, the depression comes from something that isn't related to something real that the person's dealing with. So, so I, but I don't think there's been any direct literature on that. It can't, it can't hurt to try. So. Any other questions or comments or... Um, related tan tangents? No? Okay, so it's almost time for lunch then. So thank you for your attention. Thank you all for coming out.